He used to call him Wild Bill. Why they did that, I don't know. He was just, I don't know. He drove fast. He did everything fast. He was always on the go. He loved driving. He drove down here every night and ate dinner. Played cards. Skip it. We'd play every night. My dad was always busy. I loved him. He might have been mean at times whenever I was growing up, but I loved him. He was one of a kind. Just one of a kind. He always wanted to be a millionaire. That was his goal. And he pretty much was close to making it, you know. He's a very unusual person. And he just, I don't know, he just loved people. And he knew a lot of people. That's what's hard to, you know, you don't know who, who to trust. My dad uh, taught himself because Annie went to sixth grade. And he was very intelligent. He wasn't a dummy. He didn't get where he was with nothing because he started out with nothing. Poor. 1951 was arrested in West Virginia for attempted bank robbery. He actually served 10 years when he was a young man. You know, he got out, you know, changed his life, started working in different companies, ended up buying land, put together the junkyard, started buying rental properties, and that's what he did the rest of his life. He pretty much stayed out of trouble, but, uh, you know, I'm not saying he wasn't a character neither. I think he tried to make up for lost time as far as making money. I think at one time he might have had 165. He had a lot. He had a lot of properties. As a result of going around, driving around, and collecting on these rental properties, he would collect a lot of these rental payments in cash. That was rumor. It was never proven that, I mean, his daughter said he may have had 600 bucks on him. Other people thought he had tens of thousands stashed in that place. I mean, so we're not sure what the exact motive was. If I were to take an educated guess on this, I would say it was definitely robbery. I think I received a phone call. I would think it was between 6 and 6.30 in the morning from my daughter, my oldest daughter, called and said there was a fire at the house. And I go, what do you mean? And said that my father didn't make it out of the house. I assumed that it was an electrical fire. They take uh, Mr. Wine, and we have a, they have an autopsy, and they discover that he was dead prior to the fire like as a result of a uh, gun. There was actually uh, poor patterns on the floor. You could tell it was an arson. Well, this was part of his, okay? All of this. They have just cleaned it all out. There's trailers and tractors and just everything. I just want to say goodbye. It's been a lot of years up here since I was in eighth grade. They bought that house over there and then he built this one. Moved in in 94. Now I was told they didn't find any bullets. That's the reason why I brought that chair out. I know my dad. I think that he would have fought back, but I think he got into a position and I've had a dream about it. He didn't know what was happening, but by the time he did, it was too late. Maybe there possibly was more than one person. There was another homicide. It was a home, home invasion that would have occurred in March of 2009, and it was uh, Betty McClellan. We feel there is probably a good possibility that McClellan and Noble Wine may be the result of the same actor. It may be safe to say that the persons we're looking at are probably currently incarcerated for another ordeal. The problem with Noble is uh, records were, I mean, this is cash on the barrel, so it's not like we're getting W-2s here and knowing everybody that worked for him. I mean, we have certain names we've ran down, but I'm sure there are literally 50 to 100 more names we don't even know about. My dad was sometimes, like I said, a ruthless person. But with the, uh, with the tenants that he had and stuff, I could see why. I could actually understand. He had a lot of ex-cons, but he always thought of giving them a second chance. You know, just because they did this or that. They can't all be bad, is what he said. <laughs> yeah, and just a week before that, it's the first time he ever told me I was a good daughter. Of all the years.
I wrote it down because I was up on the flea market up there at our little place that we hung out every weekend, you know. But he would check on me in the daytime whenever I would go up there by myself. Hurry up, my dad's coming. Hurry up and buy it before he comes. He'll, he'll want more money. <laughs> we played that game. It was a great game. You know, here's my daughter. You better hurry up and buy that. <laughs> you know, she's going to want more money for it. We use the same line. I went back up there. Shortly after Dad died, after I had a chance to go up, I'd only spend a couple hours there. There was candles I was sorting. And what it was is eight and a one. That's the, you know, how old he was whenever he died. The fun's all out of it. As soon as my dad left, the fun's all out. Of it. I actually see him every day. Just in my visions. Just wait for him to walk down, you know, my new ramp that he never got to come down or nothing. I don't know how someone can do that to somebody. Yeah. 81 years old. And on crutches. He was vulnerable, you know. There is no clue. How can there be closure when you don't know who did it? You know? If you want to get away with murder, move to Green County. That's what you hear if you want to know the truth. You know?